it's welcome everyone it's my pleasure to uh welcome you all today we've got a great speaker i'll give you a little background before i kick it over to him uh so i met carter hostelli through dennis all roads lead to dennis here at the meetup years and years and years ago um and by way of introduction on his linkedin page carter makes social media work for b2b marketers he's the ceo and and grand poobah there at lead tail if you read his lead tail bio it says Carter's a recovering venture-backed CEO and CFO who discovered that marketers were having all the fun. Asked to hear one of his rants, and we've heard some rants on the meetup before. I don't know if we're going to get a, a rant today, but his top five strengths, you'll love this, Carter, strategic, learner, analytic, and then a series of question marks. So without further ado, today, talking to us about how to rethink our B2B marketing in 2023, Carter Hostelli. Thank you so much, Rich. And I, I sort of crafted this deck knowing that many folks are content marketers, but I think some of the insights we pull can be uh, more, more broadly around um, B2B marketing as a whole. And, and really the, you know, the first question to get our heads around is, you know, what is the holy grail of B2B marketing? And any, any grizzled B2B marketing veteran will tell you it's getting into the magic quadrant for Gardner, into the leader's bucket. And, and that means that everyone is going to be copying your best practices for years to come, because it's all about the Gardner magic quadrant and the best practices that the outline that the leaders are doing. So all of us, you know, will figure that out and follow, follow the leader. But the truth is, you, you really can't win doing today's best practices. And, and I know I work with, and my agency works with, a, a number of venture-backed startup companies. And, and for any of you that are either helping clients or working you know, with companies that are competing against some giant enterprise, you know, the truth is you don't have the brand awareness you know, as the marketer, you know, you don't have the media budgets that they do. You don't have the content teams. Bottom line, you don't have the resources. Plus, everyone else is looking at the same gardener, magic quadrant, and, and, and trying to follow those same leaders. Um, so the key thing to really understand is, is you can't win doing today's best practices. And I, and I actually call today's best practices, sort of the dusty best practices that by the time all of them know us know them, they've, they've been out there for five, six, seven, eight years now. So, so that's the first thing to understand is you've got to come at it a different way because best practices are not going to get you where you wanna be. And so that begs the question, which is, well, what should you do? Now, in some ways, this answer is obvious, and in some ways, it tends to be pretty opaque, hence the magic eight ball. Um, you should do what will be best practices in the future, because if you can get your head around what those are, well, chances are you can start to do them today in a way that puts you ahead of uh, and on the right track relative to everyone else. Now, you know, it's been a few years, but I had this conversation with a senior marketer, um, a CMO, probably, gosh, I want to say six, six years, five, six years ago now. And she was actually calling me up. Um, she was writing a, a byline and, and wanted to, you know, get a, uh, my take on a couple things. And, and I sort of said, after our conversation, I, I said to her, hey, how are you doing? How are things going with you? And she said, the truth is, I'm, I'm really feeling burnt out. You know, as a senior B2B marketer in this environment, I, I feel like I can't stay on top of, you know, the MarTech stack and everything that's happening with digital and what's happening with all the algorithms. And, and, and I sort of feel like I've lost my soul a little bit. And by the way, this, this is not a one-off conversation. You know, I, I, I hear this a lot um, from very senior marketers <laughs> sort of turning the crank for a while. And I said to her, I said, you know, the, the, the part of the problem here is you're focused on the wrong algorithm. 
And she said to me, what do you mean? I said, you're focused on the technology algorithm. The thing you've forgotten about is the human algorithm. And, and you're doing things as a marketer and as a database marketer, like sending out all these emails or robocalls or all this other stuff, even though you as a human, you know, don't like this yourself because you're, you're, you're a, you're a C-suite decision maker and you're getting hit with all this stuff. And it really set me on the path of understanding that there are two algorithms that we are competing for and in, in understanding and, and working within as marketers. One is the human algorithm and one is the technology algorithm. So if we talk a little bit about the human algorithm, you know, this is where when we think about our buyers, buyers want it to be about them right? Buyers want to work with vendors they like and feel a human connection with. Buyers want help from subject matter experts so they can make the right purchasing decisions. Buyers want to engage on social media as part of a community. But how are we as marketers, you know, at, at, at sort of the, you know, bowing down to the technology algorithms? You know, how are we coming at it? Well, we want it to be about our, our brand's product and service. You know, we want to figure out how to further optimize the, the marketing stack and make sure we're using all the right tools and just pound sand trying to eke out a little, little extra out of them. You know, we're supporting sales teams that are focused on sending out ever more emails. And then that's informed by algorithms around buyer intent and AI insights. And heck, we just want to grow social media followers because we think about social like a glorified email list we can keep hammering again and again and again. You know, and this really creates, you know, a disconnect. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying, oh, hang on, my screen has frozen. There we go. I'm not saying that as marketers, we shouldn't take into account the algorithm. I, I, you know, as a social media marketer, I have a lot of conversations with folks these days about gaming the LinkedIn algorithm. And I say, well, you got to tag people in posts. You got to use hashtags. It's all about generating engagement quickly, which takes me down a sidebar talking about employee advocacy. You got to think about dwell time. So, you know, let's create these long mini blog posts. Let's do video, right? You, you got to get people to comment. So when you're doing polls, make sure option number four is always other and ask them to comment below. You know, my pet peeve is people like now to do posts without links because the platforms don't want to send you off platform, but it just creates a terrible user experience. But so what? I'm trying to make the algorithm work. And then you got to be pretty, you know, regular about it. And then, and then of course, there's the downside. You tag too much. You, you do these sort of things. So it's very important to, yes, understand the algorithm. And now, and Dennis, I, I know, or I'm sure you'll have a, a chat GPT algorithm meetup at some point to talk about all the stuff that's happening with this new algorithm and what it means for us. You know, all of this is wonderful and great, but we as marketers, um, you know, we forget that our buyers, you know, want to work with brands that they, you know, they like and feel a human connection with. And, and, and I sort of snark, I used to snark on calls that, hey, this was really a millennials thing, all touchy-feely, but having all of us gone through the pandemic, the truth is we all feel this way now. <laughs> we all want to work with brands that we like and feel a human connection with, right? And, and this is really a struggle for marketers when they, they truthfully are pretty obsessed around all the different type of algorithms that that make them do things that and, and often are very counter to what buyers care about and, and 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 counter to the human aspects of things. And and the secret or the answer around this is just humanize our marketing efforts. You know, I show this. Um, um, we were the social agency for for Bill.com for years and years and years, and and one of the things we really pushed with them was to you know push all the wonderful baby and brand swag stuff and it's it's funny because we'll have a client that does a post uh baby and brand swag or some equivalent and during the same month they'll have done a big funding round 200 million or whatever and much of the chagrin of the pr team uh the babies and brand swag <laughs> social posts always drive way more engagement than the funding round right and and, and that's no surprise to me and it's probably no surprise to any of you that have clicked on all the fun sort of human oriented content that's out there. 
and, and uh, on LinkedIn um, and within you know video, et cetera, et cetera. And and so, you know, what you want to think about in a marketer is just how whatever we're doing, how do we humanize it more, right? How do we showcase the people behind the brand? How do we celebrate special days like holidays? One of the things I'm telling folks and clients is, hey, Valentine's is coming up. So, you know, show your love to employees, show your love to uh, customers and partners and, and, and whatever, and, and, and do that as creating content. Super Bowl is coming up, same thing. But, but humanizing by just acknowledging others, giving shout outs, thanking folks. You know, um, shining the light on your own subject matter experts. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm talking to clients a lot about now is, look, can we stop with the boring speaker image, you know, and can we ask speakers to do a little selfie about why, you know, what they're going to be talking about and how excited they are and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so the, the question for all of you is, as you, as you create marketing content, as you, as you, you know, draft blog post, all of that, just have this question in your mind. How can you do a better job of humanizing your content. Now, if I netted it out, you know, the real insight here, I believe, is yes, the algorithms are important, but being human in your marketing approach is more important. Now, we talk about humanizing. Um, another key aspect is, you know, that I've learned is make it about others right? Or to say it another way, the more you make it about others, the more they will make it about you. The more you make it about you, nobody cares. So I just do some simple examples here. You know, um, at, at Leetail, we now have three podcast series. And look, I, I don't really care about how many streams and how much traffic it generates to the site. I, I simply look at it as an opportunity to showcase people within um, the B2B marketing community and make them the stars, right? So whether it's, you know, a podcast, you know, and I show three examples of our, you know, or it's um, um, as, as a number of you that know me, we host dinners um, in the Bay Area um, or having, having one tonight, you know, it's it, the more, you know, we work to make it about others, the more, those folks bend over backwards to raise our awareness and say nice things about us and create credibility within the B2B marketing community, right? So, so really, really important. Now, when you make it about others, a funny thing happens is you create advocacy. And, and advocacy tends to sometimes sound a little bit like a complicated word, but let me, let me simplify it. Advocacy simply means somebody likes you. And the truth is, the easiest way to get someone to like you is to like them first. And you do that, as I've just talked about, by showcasing them. So when you as content marketers think about your content roadmap, right? I ask you how much of your brand content in that roadmap is about shining the light on others. And can I mean beyond simply the occasional, you know, customer story? Okay. And, and I would, I would strongly suggest again, with the experience I have, you know, in seeing this stuff is it's not enough. Right. And, and it's not hard, right. Launch a podcast or LinkedIn live series, just to interview those within your buyer community, you know, encourage guest posts from other subject matter experts for your blog and invite target contacts to present in a webinar series, attend your VIP events, right? You know, sometimes folks say to me on social, hey, we can never get our customers to, to share our stuff. Well, I, I, I ask them a simple question back. Well, how much are you sharing your customer news on, on your feeds? You know, and it's crickets. Of course they're not. So, so look for opportunities to, to make it about your customer and share their news on your social feeds. Give them a kudos. Give them a shout out. Right. But it's really about creating advocacy. And sometimes what I hear, too, is advocacy is post-sale. And, and that's why, you know, we need more customers or it's hard to get customers to advocate. You know, I, I back in the day, I was a huge fan of Marketo and HubSpot, and I'd never once ever used their services. But I love their content and it was so helpful. So no surprise to us content marketers on the call. Right. And, and I, I advocated them all the time, even though I had never once and to this day have used their services. So advocacy is not just post-sale, it's pre-sale, right? It's, it's really every conversation you have with someone, every way you can focus on helping them. But in the context of today's discussion, the question is, 
how can you make it so your, your brand content roadmap and your marketing is, is, is shining the light on others in a way that creates advocacy? And, and I take it further. I think advocacy is the new brand awareness. You know, I joke that there's a, a lot of brands I'm aware of because I went to their site and they retarget the crap of me, uh, uh, me to the point that I will not visit their website again. Yes, I'm aware of their brand. And, and by the way, um, if they got their SDRs on top of me too, then I make a mental note that I will never buy from them. So yes, total brand aware. And I share this, I'll share stories with other marketers to go, don't go to their site because they will retarget and the SDRs will be all over you. And so, yes, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the brand, but boy, I'm not advocating at all. So, so you want to think about advocacy as, as a new brand awareness, because truly advocacy at scale is word of mouth. And we all learned long ago as, as marketers that the most powerful force out there is word of mouth marketing. But it, to me, it's truly advocacy at scale and advocacy should be what we talk about versus, uh, versus brand awareness. Now, the other interesting aspect of advocacy is it builds community because advocates spread the word, as I just mentioned, about your brand in a, in, in a way that's very trusted and credible to your buyers. Advocates also have a vested interest in seeing your brand succeed within the community. And advocates help you identify other community members that can become advocates, right? So they enlarge the party. And uh, advocates help your subject matter experts at your companies, or if you're a subject matter expert, will help you become a valued member of the community. And, and, and as you know, in the intros, we a few of us referenced Dennis and the great job Dennis has done in bringing us into this community, right? Now, I'm talking about community for a second, but I, I don't want to take for granted that, that you know, whether or not folks understand the importance of community. Right, um, the, the power of community is it has a shared purpose. It's, it's, a, it's an entity upon which community members trust on rely, and rely on each other for sharing valuable information. And then of course, what we care about as sellers is and recommendations like vendors they should try, right? Or vendors they should use. And the truth is communities are the power behind, you know, many of the top B2B brands that we today really, really take for granted, right? Whether they're marketing brands or whether technology brands, or of course, you know, uh, the content marketing meetup itself. Without community, I believe um, this is what you experience. This is an actual quote from a director of growth um, from a conversation I had less than two weeks ago. This is what that director said to me. She said, they downloaded a white paper, then I emailed them seven times over the last 30 days, no response. There's got to be a better way. And, and I suspect a lot of sales teams are feeling this way. Uh, I sure see how many emails I get from vendors. Um, and in this type of market, it's not like you want to, you know, be, be trying to use these sort of tactics. Um, you know, you, you sort of hoped you had a community to tap into to begin with. But this is really the power of community. And, and even when I talk to folks about social media, which is my particular domain, it's amazing to me how folks are still very focused on follower account. Okay, and that's just an optics thing. Do we have more followers than our competitors do and all of this? And I have to explain to them that if none of these followers have engaged with one of your LinkedIn posts, for example, in the last you know, 30 to 60 days, it's as if they're not following you, they're not gonna see your stuff. So we gotta switch from thinking audience and followers to community because community is truly an asset and it's the power that sits behind some of those brands that we've already talked about. And, and it's not hard to signal community, share the content of others. Thanks folks for sharing the brand content, responding about comments and questions, you know, start to ask questions and poll, show conversation is two way, right? And, and by the way, it's gonna drive your social uh, performance. You're gonna see a lot more engagement. This is another thing that drives me batty. And usually this is when I'm talking to the PR teams and I'll, I'll sort of be upfront here and tell you that nobody is biting at this. But all the PR teams out there um, are, are really trying to push the executives to, to do thought leadership. You know, they're all tasking us as content marketers to write more thought leadership. And, and I always try to say, look, you know, it's like all these executives in particular are trying to be the smartest person in the room. 
But on the other hand, we all know what it's like to be around someone that's trying to be the smartest person in the room, right? And instead, we want to think about, hey, how can someone be positioned as a valued member of the community? Now, even that question itself leads to lots of interesting insights, like who is our community and what do they value and how can I add value to them, right? So it, it starts to move us in the right direction when we're thinking about, you know, thinking about content. Because the truth is when, when we, we're obsessed about the customer, let me say it another way, when we're obsessed about the prospect, we're really only looking through the lens of, you know, how do I get them to buy? versus, you know, what is the larger thematics of what are they trying to achieve and, and what do they support and what are their affinities, right? And how can we be a valued member to them? So, you know, as you switch and start to think about, you know, community, you know, as I said, there's some basic questions. Who do you want in your community? Now, we're going to touch on that again in a moment or two, but how does your content strategy help build community? How does your content marketing add value to the community, right? These are some of the questions we, we, we need to start to think more about, in my opinion. Because when you boil it all down, I really believe, and, and some of this belief comes from, I will tell you, I'm biased. You know, we've had a number of clients that, you know, are in the open source space and just seen the power of, you know, having the developer relations, for example, focused on supporting the community, how that turns into very, very powerful marketing and brand awareness and advocacy, which is everything we're talking about today. So I just bear hug it and, and say the future B2B marketing is community because I am literally sick of how many lead gen calls I get, how many SDR calls. You know, um, we're all probably at the point where none of us answer the phone if we don't recognize the numbers showing. And yet that's so counter to when someone from the community reaches out and needs help. It's the first email I follow up with. I make the time, I do everything I can, like Dennis inviting me and Rich inviting me to speak today. So given that we sort of are starting to understand, hey, best practices, you know, I just can't do what those are. And I've got to humanize marketing and I've got to shift to think about advocacy and how advocacy at scale turns into word and mouth and builds community. Well, we still have the very tactical, fundamental thinking of, okay, well, how do we reach and engage these community members, right? I'm a big believer in account-based marketing. I, I believe it really helps you align on who exactly you want to be, you know, have in your community. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm, I'm against inbound, but, but most of the clients we deal with, you know, they're not selling something for 50 bucks a month. Um, and and they're they're doing a lot of this account based marketing stuff. Um, and 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 also, I'm a big believer that social media research helps you discover where this community th this community that you're targeting already exists. It's kind of funny to me. I have the conversation often when the concept of community comes up, and 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 every every client comes at it the same way. How do we build our own community? You know, how do we build a community? And I'm like, well, you know, the community most likely already exists somewhere. So maybe the question is, <laughs> where, where first is the community now happening? And then secondly, how do we add value to the community? So the community invites us in versus thinking we're going to just launch a Slack channel, you know, or a LinkedIn group or something else. And all of a sudden, you know, just add water, there's community, right? So, so you kind of have to think about it the right way. Um, so, you know, the, the other thing that ties into this is I, I really believe that the notion of the content funnel is, is very outdated, you know, top, mid, bottom, I get it, you know, I, I really understand it really well. But I think we want to switch it up to be more from the, you know, the community or the buyer's perspective, right? You know, how do they discover uh, brands and vendors? How, how do they become interested in them over time and then finally have intent around that? But before we tackle that, you know, we're still very bound by this very basic thing, you know, um, why does content marketing still mean mostly text? I mean, it just drives me nuts. And I talk to a zillion content marketers and, you know, it, it's just mostly text still. And, and the reason I bring it up in the context of discovery, interest, intent is because video is actually the best content for a brand to use to get discovered since we're all reading and seeing our content and watching our content on phones. 
right? So it's really about video. And, and, and also all of the platforms, if I go back to the fact that yes to algorithms, they're all leaning in a video because they're all super envious of the success TikTok is ha having. And TikTok is further um, training us about the power of video and looking for video, et cetera, right? Um, and you know, when I talk to early stage companies, maybe there's just a marketer or two at this company, I'm going like, just, you know what? Just leapfrog text and go right to video. Okay, you can still pull out the transcript, summarize it as a blog post, have it for SEO. So look, you get the text stuff, but go right to video. Um, but I also know for many of us that have been content marketers for a while, flipping a switch to video is non-trivial and that it's really about empowering users uh, and um, to engage with our content however they want. So if they want text, great. If they want audio, great. If they want video, great. So, so if you can't leapfrog right to video first mindset, then at least shift from thinking text only to text plus mindset. So text plus, let me think about some video. Let me think about some audio. Let me think about some other interactive ways of doing things versus just scribbling out, you know, the, the next content piece, uh, written text. Okay. It, it is also why, you know, I, I sort of have an opinion that, you know, video podcasts are really the new blog posts. And, um, and this is a direction we want to be thinking about. Um, the other sort of thing I would say, besides the fact that, you know, the funnel's outdated and we should be thinking discovery, interest, and intent, and that we have to lean to text plus or video first, is that, you know, the vast amount of our effort as content marketers or even as marketers is still on the production side of things. Okay. And, and, and we need the production. We need to understand our target audience. We need to identify themes and topics to write about. We need to create the content, i.e. write the text. We need to figure out the graphics to go with it. And we need to hit the publish button. But increasingly, and we, and, you know, we, we've got to be thinking about, you know, the real puzzle, which is how do we get content distributed effectively and get it syndicated, right? And I always define these as, as two different things. So to me, content distribution means essentially leveraging our own website, our own email database, and our own social media channels. And, 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 and I really believe that even there, there's not enough thought put into how best to distribute the content. And then there's content syndication that I really view as leveraging somebody else's audience, audience or platform. So how do we post in a way that gets other people to amplify our social posts? How do we get our employees to share? Because believe it or not, we don't own their social profiles. How do we get influencers to share? How do we get more intermediate pickup? And how do we leverage social advertising? I really believe you know, the puzzle is more about the, uh, being smart about content distribution and content syndication. That doesn't mean the production is not important, but we shouldn't be spending 95% of our thinking around production and barely 5% on distribution and syndication. And I know why we tend to do that because we have an over-reliance or as I put hope that somehow SEO will do the heavy lifting for us. So we create great content, lots of keywords, index, we don't have to worry about this content distribution syndication stuff, okay? And I would argue that that's wrong, right? And, and I would argue, and this is Rand Fishkin quote, you know, I would argue that it's not only your big competitors, again, who have more content, more brand awareness, more whatever, you know, uh, page rank, um, but you're also competing against Google, right? And, and, and it's really hard to win this battle in any meaningful way to really, really feed the sales teams. So from that, I, I came to believe that really social advertising is the new SEO. Okay, when you think about SEO, it's hard to get on page one. You never get enough leads, unpredictable lead flow. Many of my leads are not high quality. Okay, it, 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 it creates this hamster wheel of more and more content. Okay, we can't directly leverage for demand gen. For social ads, we can control a lot of these variables. We can test, we can focus on anchor pieces. And, and I'm not saying SEO doesn't matter. I'm just saying, hey, can we shift some of the thought and energy from SEO over to how to better leverage distribution, syndication, and in this specific example, social ads. And when you start to put it all together, and I'll send the deck over, maybe the slide will be helpful, but you know, you start to go, okay, let me put these pieces together. 
Okay, let me think about the stages, discovery, interest, and intent. And let me think about what would be the best type of content at each stage on the different social platforms. And then let me look at it in the context also of social advertising, right? That the audiences I'm gonna create, how I use retargeting and, and, and how I should judge whether or not it's performing well and, and, and how we'll generate leads. So you can start to put these different concepts together in a way that leads to different strategies and best practices than arguably what I see being done today. And I'm gonna just end with my view of the world. Um, um, and this is just how I look at things. I, I really think that we need to move from this funnel view to how many MQLs to you know the debate with the sales team about how do we get more leads, we need more leads, to really having something pick up the concepts we talked about today. Okay, if I know ABM, the strategic accounts, the top target accounts, and I know who I want to be in the community, and I focus my efforts around the content roadmap and social, et cetera, on driving advocacy within this community, it'll turn into deal flow. Okay, it will turn into deal flow. And I found over the last uh, um, handful of years that this has worked really, really well for, for what my agency, Leetail, does. You know, we're a seven-figure agency and we've never had, nor will we ever have a salesperson. And we focus on building community and advocacy. And I tell you, every week leads come in. And, and I don't think this is just an agency thing. I think this can be very, very scalable. Plus, it prompts the right questions and goals. So if my questions are around, well, who should be in the community and how do we add value? Those are great questions for marketers to be tackling. And if my goal is to increase the size of the community, and increase advocacy in the community, boy, that sure feels like it's a much more fulfilling to be the marketer trying to do that uh, versus the marketer feeling really frustrated because they can't generate enough leads for the sales team and all they're doing is trying to figure out MarTech stacks and all this other crap that burns them out because it feels good to be thinking about how do I grow the community? And it feels good to be thinking about how do I make it about others, make it human and drive advocacy? And, and, and I have seen again and again and again, every year I see it, it drives in wonderful deal flow um, with a much shorter sales cycle too, because you've been recommended in. It just makes it a lot easier. Now, with that, I will um, end with this one last sort of insight. Whether you agree with me on any of this or not, the fundamental thing is you're gonna become a better marketer by focusing on where things are going, figuring out for yourself, you know, then how you can take advantage of that and build it into your own best practices today that reflect that. And you're going to be much more successful doing that versus trying to regurgitate the same best practices everyone else is doing. I will now open it up for uh, any questions, comments, uh, folks that want to uh, counter my opinions. I welcome it all. Well, very good, Carter. Thank you so much. There's been a lively. Uh, chat going, and I've asked for some questions there. I also queued up one of my own as kind of a give people a chance. If you don't want to chat, you can also raise your hand on Zoom. Dennis and I are call on you. My question is actually a question that was the first one in the chat, and this is around measurement. Now, I'm mm -hmm. increasingly focused in my role to measure the performance of the content we publish, mm -hmm. not just is it achieving our business objectives, but more importantly, is it meeting the informational needs of the audience? Like, are we serving them something they value? Question in the chat is from uh, Priyanka, what are some KPIs, some key performance indicators to keep in mind while advocating for another person or brand? Well, you know, I think it, I think basically you want to shift from, and this will seem a little counterintuitive because we were talking about community a moment ago, <clears throat> which feels like it's a, it's a big group, is you want to have KPIs that are starting to shift from the notion of how many to who. Okay, so all of the KPIs you now use, you know, time on site, how many visits to the page, how many leads generate, you know, all that's great. But, you know, when you start to, and, and some of this is going to tie in ABM, when you start to say, hey, here are specifically the people I want to reach and engage. And did I do that or not? Or how many did I reach and engage? Then, then the argument in getting more people is going to be easy. And I, and I see this on the social side. Like I'll talk about engagements and all of that and the CMO or the CEO will sort of roll their eyes. But then I show them some of the people in particular that followed the page mm -hmm. or that, that, that liked it or that whatever. And they go, oh, 
Do our salespeople know this person just started following the page? Or, oh, that's exactly the type of folks we want sharing, engaging with. It's a whole different conversation. So it's, it's less quantity, more quality. It's um, about the who, right? right and, who. and it's counterintuitive because, you know, one of my themes last year is what's old is new again. Oh. And, and I believe that social, we have to stop thinking about one to many and increasingly start thinking about one to one and one to few. Okay. Okay. So it more. really is about the who. Okay. Thanks, Carter. I've got a couple more questions here going in sequence from the chat. This is from Melissa. What do you think about dark social? There are recommendations happening in online communities that don't have proper tracking, right? Tying into metrics here, such as Facebook, Slack, Discord, Reddit groups. I know I've tried some of the business products recommended by other business owners in these communities. So dark social, Carter, how's that play? Well, I, I think a couple of things. So obviously, um, dark social is a, a measurement and arguably an attribution problem. But and, and it'll always be there. And part of this is because, you know, Google doesn't want to show you anymore. <clears throat> right. Because back in the day, they used to. Um, I, I really flip it around and say, you know, if you're focusing more, most of well, I, I would take it two ways. So number one, you can see, especially on social, who likes your stuff, who retweets your stuff who is looking at your profile, et cetera. So there's plenty you can see from which you can then build an argument around to say others are doing this. The other thing is, and, I, and I'm really amazed, I was talking on a, a client call earlier today, and this is a, a pretty sophisticated RevOps company, and they're not even doing UTM tracking. They're not even doing any of the backend stuff. And I often talk to uh, clients where the salespeople aren't even asking, hey, how'd you hear about us when you jumped in when someone signed up via the book, a demo, or contact us. And by the way, that's the first question I always ask. How did you hear about Leetail? Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so you're going to get information around the ranks that you can do a hypothesis. I don't think we will solve. Now, now someone else on the call may have a different opinion. I, I think dark social will always be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's really about what are the indicators you see from how folks are engaging all the way through to you know, making sure the salespeople are asking the question and logging it in Salesforce. How did someone hear about us? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Carter. Two two comments and then more questions. One, it's what we try to do on the meetup. How'd you hear about the meetup? And it's exactly Dennis. That's exactly um, right. Two, two. As a fanboy of Rand's, you know he's no longer with Moz, but I think some of you are familiar with Spark Toro. If you're not, look in the chat link. Great audience research, getting at the who. Who are you trying to reach? Where are they? How might you reach them in unconventional ways? And um, trying to get them on the meetup as well. Amanda's super smart. A couple more questions here from Priyanka. Um, question, what are some boundaries you could set as an advocate for a person brand? Priyanka, I might need a little more color on that. Boundaries, um, uh, maybe Carter, you have an answer, but I'm not certain. What did you mean, Priyanka, by boundaries? Hi, Rich. Uh, Hi. By bound, by, by, thank you for taking my question. And uh, thank you for uh, Carter for doing this uh, presentation. By boundary, I meant um, uh, basically uh, you don't want to come across i mean uh you want to help the uh, brand or the person but uh you also don't want to come across as uh as uh, being pushy or being yeah, very, yeah. so yeah, that no, it, kind of balanced i think kind of like uh trying to be helpful to the brand but not coming across as to pushy or spammy or, you know, that's yes. all. Yeah. So, so I'm going to make two comments on this. So, so number one, it has to be authentic. Okay. Cause, cause we all, if, if someone is trying to upsell us and they're telling us, cause it's trying to help, they, they care about us, want to help us, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's just so it's, it's painfully obvious. They're not being authentic. So you got to be authentic. And number two, what makes it easier to be authentic, it, you know, I, I, I'm a former startup VP of sales. I deal with salespeople a lot. It, it always drives me nuts. Uh, the salespeople are always trying to close the person on the phone versus turn the person on the phone into an advocate upon which that person unlocks the rest of their network. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you focus on helping someone and turning them into an advocate, then you're going to be authentic and then you're not going to push because, you know, you may be the first person to say, you know what, we're not the great, a great, the right solution for you. You should go check these folks out. Okay. So, so that's really, that, that's really the key. And the mindset as a salesperson or even as a marketer is to realize if I turn the person I'm talking to on the phone into an advocate, I may get their sale and I'm going to own the mind share of, Whenever anyone in their network asks them what vendor I should talk to, they're they're going to point in my way. Yeah. Versus, how do I close this person on the phone? 
right. because that's that's going to take me down the path of being pushy, even if I, I come at it authentically and try to help. Right. Well, Carter, it occurs to me that you illustrated your answer with the GIF from Wednesday where her roommate's like, oh, not a hugger. I, I get it. Right. So it's not crossing that boundary. A um, couple more questions. We've got about 12 minutes left. I'm going to go quickly here. Another from Priyanka. What is the best channel to build a community? Well, the first thing I'd say is, and this is where the social listening comes in, it's, it's, it's really a function of where is the community currently, because the community is somewhere. Now, whether they're in a Facebook group, LinkedIn group, whether it's a meetup like this, right? Whether, whether they're on Reddit, okay? Um, that's the, the thing you want to discover. Okay. okay. Okay, it's not just saying LinkedIn, because they're buyers. I mean, that, that's, that's not correct. Right, right. Um, okay, thank you. I'm moving quickly here. Sean Murphy, question. Was not clear on whether you, I'm oh, sorry, just pick up there. You do not put links in LinkedIn posts, please, in the algorithm, or put links in making them more useful for humans. A little bit about that game, Carter, you mentioned uh, LinkedIn, yeah, whether LinkedIn yeah, not. Yeah, so in a perfect world, if we think about the LinkedIn algorithm, and again, I could be saying Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, the LinkedIn algorithm, and I had the human algorithm, and I sort of overlap them into a Venn diagram, that's where I want to play. Okay. Now, my North Star is customer experience, user experience. So when I'm, I'm wrestling between the algorithm versus the human, it means I go with the human. So yes, I understand that LinkedIn will give a post a little extra love if you put a link in a comment, but I also know that that's extremely frustrating for a human if they actually are interested in, in going to the information. And by the way, LinkedIn will hide the link and don't even put it as the most relevant comment. So you have to you have to, I mean, it's, it just ends up being a very, very bad experience. So I, when in doubt, I default to human. Good, smart. And this, here's a good segue from Floyd Smith. Resonates with me. Mainstream way is basically shouting at people, shouting louder when that doesn't work, right? This is more inviting. How do you get team or upper management support for it? How do I build a business case, Carter, and get buy-in from up the chain? Well, this is where account-based marketing is really good. Okay. okay, so um, if your company is doing or investigating account-based marketing, I typically wrap it around account-based marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm making it about the who, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, and, and, and that's really that's really the way to come at it. And that's why in my math equation, I start with ABM, the strategic accounts. And, and mm -hmm. I've learned this over time that if I'm just talking about community and advocacy, it all seems fluffy, it all seems whatever. And so I've got to anchor it in something that they understand first, right? Is is how I've how I've learned to sort of to sort of come at this. Now, if you're not if they're not doing account based marketing, typically they still will be using terms like and have strategic accounts. Right. I will say, let's figure out who our strategic accounts are, and let's figure out how to start to build community with with the people at those strategic accounts and, and showcase those people within content. Yeah. And it can be as simple as saying. It'd be great to let's reach out to some of them to see if they'd like to guess on the podcast or, you know, come to our or whatever. But you're really you're really making it around something that at least the executives have talked about or heard about. It's being pushed, you know, versus versus trying to just do the fluffy community thing, which I guarantee you will not get any traction in a meaningful yeah. way. Real good. Uh, sequentially, next question is a nice segue. This is from Jennifer Johnson. In introducing community centric KPIs. How do you balance the conflict with competing numbers based KP with competing based KPIs? That's kind of schizophrenic behavior across channels. Seems like you need to get the org to buy into human centric measurements and scrapping the funnel altogether. So, uh, what do we do with community centric KPIs? Well, well, what I would say is this: is a, there's always a practicality, and I've had this conversation with CMOs a lot. Right? They'll say. Well, you know, I love the North Star thing, but I could just dive into community and advocacy. My CEO will never buy off it, right? And I say, set it up as a pilot thing, right? Set it up as a pilot thing. Now, coming back to sort of the broad question around KPIs is have KPIs that are oriented around the who, okay? So here's 50 uh, tar target accounts. How many of these target accounts do we engage on social? How many of these target accounts do we uh, engage with our content or our marketing? How many of these target accounts came to the website, right? But it's got to be mirrored with advocacy, meaning um, you, you want opportunities to, to make the content about these people. I, I always say that, you know, and, and we used to talk about, you know, pre-pandemic, all about the content tidal wave or the content crush or whatever. And I always used to say, look, there's one thing that if it hits my email, I stop everything I'm doing and look at it. It's a Google alert. 
Hmm. Now it's a LinkedIn alert or a Twitter alert. Somebody mentioned me. I stop everything, go check it out, right? So, so you want to think about, so there's a practicality that says, you know, you're going to keep the KPIs, the CMO still want MQLs and all this stuff, um, but you're going to start to insert in KPIs that are very much about the who, and you're going to start to influence the content roadmap where you're going to do a Q&A posts, or you're going to do these things that give you a chance to measure the success of something based on, you know, who you were able to engage and, and making sure that that's tied back to the accounts that the, you know, the teams care most about. I always say in talking to folks, I go, look, you know, we're going to use social to really support the sales team around their target accounts. And immediately folks start head nodding at me and go and tell me more. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, Carter. Well, I, I think I've gone through at least all the questions on the chat sequentially. If I've missed you, either chat it now or raise your hand or just come off mute. And we have Carter for a couple more minutes. Um, I'll pass it over to Dennis as well. Dennis, do you have any questions for, for Carter? Any uh, gotchas or curveballs or... Uh, loaded questions, perhaps? Or it's rare, Dennis, that you actually agree with me on something. <laughs> That's not true. I mean, <laughs> we have healthy debates, but um, well, my question is, you meant, since you mentioned it on the slide, chat GPT, this is a little bit well, maybe off topic, but maybe it's not if we're talking about 2023 strategy. Just give us your preliminary thoughts on chat GPT. Yeah, what I would say is I throw in the algorithm bucket Right. Um, but what I would say is it's, it's always the lowest common denominator, right? That's where fear is, right? Whether it's chat GPT or whether it's low code, no code, if you're an engineer, right? And so, yes, that those are technologies will help me summarize a podcast quickly, maybe write some generic social posts, maybe these sort of things. But you know what won't replace? It won't replace a really engaging conversation over a video yeah. podcast. It won't, it, it won't replace, um, you know, someone, someone writing a, a post uh, and having a, a, a strong view or opinion around it, which is why as you get a sense of me or hear me, I have very strong opinions, right? So, so we shouldn't be afraid of things that are knocking out the lowest common denominator. Instead, we should really build them in um, because if, if that can do something, you know, more effectively and, and um, then let's have that do that because we can use our time and our expertise and our passions and our opinions, creating creating other stuff that chat uh, chat GPT will not be able to uh, to replace. Any other opinions on that? That that's that's sort of mine. Well, Floyd noted that pr previously I disagreed about disagreeing with you. So, Floyd, <laughs> I disagree. I disagree with you, Floyd. Exactly. What, one of the best one of the best rants was back in the in-person DNN days where Carter, I think it was an ask me anything. And there it was a series of rant answers. I loved it. Um, I, I do want to catch another question from Jennifer. Sat in a CMO call the other day on a similar topic. They actually moved community development and advocacy outside of marketing. Seems like that sets up its own problem. Wondering your thoughts here, Carter, in terms of where does community sit organizationally? Well, I, I would say there, there's a, um, a perceived notion of community today that um, sort of dovetails um, in with existing users slash support, help desk, all of that. Okay, so broadly customer support. Okay, and, and from that notion, um, you know, it may very well make sense to move it out of marketing. When I'm talking about community and the really what we're looking at, is is you know how do we sell right because we're on the marketing side mm -hmm. how do we how do we create brand awareness slash advocacy and and make it easier for our salespeople and get in there and and that should absolutely uh, be a marketing thing the, the problem is you know just like i was talking about advocacy a lot of people think advocacy is post-sale a lot of people think community is 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 post use um, use or post-sale or it's existing users you know but the opportunity is really to plug into the, you know, the larger story around community, especially if we're looking to drive business, which is those that aren't using our product. And, and that should really, really be focused by marketing, which is why I always say, if, if you talk to marketers and they say they're customer centric and all of that, that means they're trying to understand how, you know, the pain of the customer in, in, in the context of how to buy the product that's being sold. I really look at it as that you know what is it the community supports and how can we best support them um, in in a way that then can create advocacy that can result in sales because they trust us and we're credible. That whole piece for sure um, should sit with marketing. Yeah, 
Well, as, as we run out of time here, Carter, I wanna thank you. I'm gonna pass it to you, Dennis, but thank you for such lively engagement, everyone on the call, Carter, for the presentation. In the chat, you'll see I did put a couple links if you wanna stalk Carter online on Twitter and LinkedIn, et cetera. And I'll now pass it to you, Dennis, to, to uh, take us out. Thanks. Ah, thanks so much, Rich. Uh, Carter, thanks for presenting. For those of you that want to learn more about Carter's company, visit leadtail.com. And uh, so speaking in chat GPT, it's not published yet, but our very next meetup will be in February. And Rich and Rosemary will do a demo of some use cases that you, for chat GPT in marketing. Uh, so stay tuned. I, I will publish it this afternoon. So you'll, most of you are subscribed to our group, so you'll see the notification. Uh, and other than that, stay safe and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.